Good evening, ladies and gents. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. It's such an honor to have events like this, and one I've been looking forward to for quite some time. So we have a monthly series with Mark Crispin Miller, and he's brought us such amazing, lovely events. Thanks for coming down. And Stuart Leonard from Occupy Media is going to come and hold down the fort and, and tell us all sweet nothings as a lovely host of this event. Okay, thank you. It's kind of really an honor to be standing here with these gentlemen. I have some notes for a quick pitch for a pamphlet series. You know, being a poet, you'd think I'm used to begging for funds. Not really that good at it. The Occupy Media pamphlet series is a worthwhile endeavor that um, brings important voices into the Occupy discourse. Uh, I think I wanted to just start off with a quick anecdote that reflects the spirit of what this pamphlet series is about. On October 1st, um, 10-1-11, my family and I participated in the first OWS march on the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, so I'm sorry if you got stuck in traffic that day. I was so inspired by that event, I wrote the poem Taking Brooklyn Bridge the next day. And then I immediately thought of Greg Ruggiero, an activist and a man who has published related materials for over several decades. So I give him a call and I told him about the march and the poem and how excited I was and he responded that he was there and that it was the first time he ever got arrested for civil disobedience. So he was ener as energized as I was and in several weeks he began this pamphlet series. So the current publications include works by Noam Chomsky, Mumia Abu-Jamal and myself. <laughs> Uh, I guarantee, guarantee that the first two at least are worth reading. Future pamphlets by Ralph Nader, Angela Davis, and uh, others are on the way, waiting in the wings. So the pamphlets are cheap, unique, and informative. The iconic cover art was uh, contributed by R. Black, the uh, Occupy artist, very much associated with Occupy. Uh, we are a nonprofit org. Uh, actually, I think my publisher loses money on these things, so we do what we can to raise funds. So there are some pamphlets over on the table there today, and if you can make a donation and leave an email, we'll get back to you with info, and we'll even have a special price for future pamphlets. There's also a website that's written down over there, zuccottiparkpress.com, and uh, it will also include an Occupy forum, uh, where we're going to expand that debate and publish original essays. So that's it. Any help you can give or just spread the word about uh, Occupy Media Pamphlet Series. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you for coming. I'm Mark Crispin Miller. Um, I, there's no elegant way to say this. I, I have to start by telling you that this is being videotaped so you have to give up all your rights to privacy if you, if you ask a question. But I don't think any of the, these guys with cameras are with the NYPD. I can, I can almost certainly promise you that that's the case. Uh, now, this, this event tonight, um, we called it the future of the occupation. And it, uh, you know, obviously will concern the question of the occupation's future, but will range more widely than that. I'm going to uh, introduce the panel fairly quickly. Um, first up to speak will be my colleague, uh, Andrew Ross, who, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's kind of fortuitous that all our guests have new books out, so I guess we could call this a literary event, among other things. Andrew's new book is called uh, Bird on Fire. It's about America's least sustainable city. Uh, it's, you know, definitely worth reading. And let me add, parenthetically, that since this is an independent bookstore uh, and these are struggling authors, I mean, it's not Danielle Steele up here, uh, if, if, you, if you could consider actually buying some of these books, it would be a noble gesture and the author will sign the copy, okay? So uh, Andrew will go first, uh, followed by um, another of my colleagues, Nick Merzoff whose new book is called The Right to Look. Uh, and then, uh, finally, uh, we will hear from David Graeber, who uh, is the author of the book Debt, 
and who has found himself much bemused over the last few months to see that the media keeps insisting that he is the mastermind of the occupation, <laughs> which is what the media has always done, right? They have to find a leader. Uh, he's been elected and has been running away from his constituents in the media for months. Uh, so he's not the mastermind of the occupation, but he can speak brilliantly about um, an issue that's crucial to that movement. Let me also, before I sit down, uh, acknowledge and apologize for the racial, gender, generational, and occupational homogeneity of this panel, OK? Uh, we uh, actually made efforts to vary the lineup, uh, but our efforts came to naught. Uh, I'm so sorry. I am, actually. So you're stuck with this um, rather gray spectacle, OK? Uh, so each of, each of our guests will speak for about 10 minutes or so, and then we're going to throw it open to questions. Hi. Have we met? <laughs> and um, standing in my way. I'm interested in this revolution. OK. Thanks. Uh, and um, when you ask a question, who is that guy? <laughs> when you ask a question, we're going to have to repeat it so that it will be picked up by uh, the video, which we you know, hope will go viral. OK? <laughs> uh, so um, thank you for coming. We're going to start with Andrew Ross. That's fine. Okay. That's good. Can everyone hear? <clears throat> Let me know if you can hear at the back. Um, so the the leading question is about the future of Occupy. Does does Occupy have a future? Of course it does. Even if Occupy activities cease tomorrow, it would still have a very palpable future for all sorts of reasons. The, the most uh, common cliche that we hear as an expression of this is that Occupy has changed the national conversation, which is another way of saying it's generated permission for some public opinion makers to uh, voice out loud what they would hitherto have said in in-house rants at dinner parties. Um, so it's become acceptable to rail against the obscenely uneven uh, distribution of wealth in this country. Even among the plutocrats, uh, Warren Buffett's voice is no longer a lone voice acknowledging that uh, the 1% has been waging a very successful class war over the last 30 years or so. That said, the Buffett factor is a very interesting one uh, because when plutocrats start speaking truth from power, and speaking truth from power is basically what Warren Buffett does when he says, you know, we should be paying more taxes. Uh, when they start doing that, they're lobbying for something they really want. And, uh, and when, when Buffett says that we will pay more taxes, he's, he's basically, this is a deal that's being offered. He's saying we will pay more taxes on one condition that you do not alter the system by which we lay our hands on the wealth in the first place. Um, in that regard, he's kind of channeling the immortal words of uh, Don Fabrizio, who was the uh, Sicilian aristocrat and the leopard, who said, uh, if we want things to stay just as they are, then things will have to change. Um, <clears throat> so uh, financial manipulation for reasons that don't need to be rehearsed here, I think for this audience, has been the most effective way of redistributing wealth. And the uh, creation, the financial manipulation of debt in particular has been a master theme of Occupy, uh, thanks in no small part to David's book. And, uh, but what of the other very uh, powerful claim of Occupy? This is what democracy looks like. <coughs> what is the future of that claim? Is this what democracy should look like? If, um, and if it, if it is, uh, who would stand to benefit most from that? What if the horizontal model of direct democracy that is Occupy's house style were to be pushed into every venue of civil society, eventually challenging the roots of a representative democ democratic system? 
what would that look like? Do we have the political guts to imagine the consequences and who, who would stand to benefit most from that? The answer is by no means, I think, uh, a foregone conclusion. The answer is by no means obvious. Um, democ uh, within OWS itself, at least, uh, this, the horizontal model has had a rather rough winter. Um, it's no secret that, uh, and it's a rough winter that's come after a very, you know, beautiful autumn of love. Um, but it's no secret that the, the protocols of the, the General Assembly process have been sorely tested in the last couple of months or so. And, or rather, more precisely, the zeal of those who have most far-reaching investment in those protocols have been, has been sorely tested. And um, I think it's fair to say that uh, the outcome has strengthened those within the movement who were always skeptical in the first place of the proposition that the process is the product. Um, this idea in the historical record of social movements, this, uh, this proposition of uh, uh, faith in the formal integrity of, um, of, the pro of the process, especially among prefigurative uh, communities of the sort that we saw in Zuccotti Park, that kind of conviction has often impaired the capacity of organized groups to move their energy beyond a circle of acolytes and into the arterial bloodstream of political change. Um, for, for people who, within Occupy, who want Occupy to be this sort of living, breathing alternative to mainstream society, it seems that almost every, every, non uh, every non hierarchical act of fellow feeling is, uh, is an opportunity to set a better norm. Every hand twinkle is a step closer to the beautiful community. For those who are less patient um, and who want to propel the movement into every corner of civil society, they're more likely to settle for a less perfect version of the Occupy polity. And I think the tension between these two positions is, uh, is very active right now, and we're likely to see versions of it being played out in the next several months or so. Personally, I don't feel that it's, a, it's, a, it's an unproductive tension. I think it's a very productive tension, uh, and certainly not a weakness, least of all a debilitating weakness. It cannot be a weakness for a movement that, uh, that generates respect for autonomy. That said, um, Without a tacit promise of a beautiful community, we are no more than a loose program of tactics. And without a tactical engagement of the public, we cannot call ourselves a movement. So uh, to go back to the issue of debt, I want to go back to the issue of debt for a brief reflection because um, my, my energies within Occupy have mostly been in helping to organize the Occupy student debt campaign. And as I mentioned before, debt, uh, the imposition of debt is a very effective uh, instrument of wealth redistribution, but it's much more seldom seen as a political instrument. And that's what I want to dwell on for a few minutes. And it should be said that student debt in particular is a terribly effective method of wealth redistribution. Student loans are some of the most lucrative loans you can make in the financial industry um, because the debtors have no protections or rights whatsoever and when the cumulative student debt load passes the one trillion mark in the next one trillion dollar mark in the next couple of months there'll be champagne glasses being raised all over Wall Street as a result so uh, debt yes it's effective instrument of wealth uh, redistribution but it's also a political instrument an instrument of power take mortgage equity uh, mortgage loans, mortgage debt. Home ownership was introduced, was promoted from the Hoover administration onwards as a national program for staving off socialism in this country. Explicitly so. In the, 19, in the 1930s and the 1940s, the, the concept of the government guaranteed long-term mortgage loan 
was conceived in part as a way of defining what could be called anti-communist citizenship. Remember William Levitt, who was a mass market merchant builder in the post-war years, declared that no one could be a homeowner and a communist at the same time. And in the decades that followed, I think it's fair to say that you could not be a first-class citizen in this country unless you entered into a long-term relationship of debt with a banking institution. Now, that said, an indebted citizenry is not a free citizenry. It's a population whose future has been foreclosed already by the threat of a ruined credit score. It's a population whose, uh, whose political imagination has been narrowed accordingly. And uh, th there are very few people who think of their mortgage debt as a form of social control, which is further proof of how effective it is. Now, the rise of student debt is a case in point also. Uh, it may sound a little conspiratorial to some of you, but I think it's no coincidence that the student debt burden began to rise after the wave of student radicalism in the 1960s. Um, ever since then, what we've seen is the inexorable uh, but steady transfer from the state to the student of the costs of higher education in this country. And um, this is usually described as a result of, or explained as a result of taxpayer revolts. The taxpayers are no longer willing to fund higher education. Or it is explained as part of a neoliberal effort to privatize every last sector of public goods provision. By contrast, it's much, it's much more rarely seen as, uh, as a political intentional effort to stifle the optional political imagination of the student body, to quell the potential outbreak of insurgency among the student body. And that's something that I would want to pay attention to. If you are, um, if you're landed with a crushing debt uh, burden on day one of college, if you're forced to work several jobs on the side in order to stave off going further into debt, if you are obliged to view your degree as a bargain for which you are trading in your future wages, these are not propitious conditions under which you could cultivate a free critical mind, let alone a radical one. By contrast, they're, they're perfectly serviceable conditions for an elite that does not want an educated, radical citizenry on its hands. And I think we should recognize that for what it is. So is this a justified political analysis? I would say yes to, to the degree to which higher education is now almost entirely dependent on student debt, to the degree to which our elites uh, preach to our youth that they need a degree as a passport for a decent job. Higher education, as a result, will increasingly be both a debt trap and also a graveyard for the student political imagination, which is a very sorry state of affairs. Um, some of you may uh, not be happy with the currency of the analogy of student debt with indenture. Um, I happen to find it quite useful myself as an analogy. Uh, after all, uh, the traditionally indentured usually have a guaranteed job to walk into in order to enable them to pay off their debts in a relatively finite fashion. Graduates of today's knowledge factories have no such guarantees. Um, just to end with, uh, just say a few words about the Occupy Student Debt Campaign. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's based on a pledge of refusal. Uh, signer, signatories uh, pledge to withhold their loan payments after a million others have signed up. And it's, it's based on the concept of debt refusal. Now, in a culture, like ours, where the sanctity of contracts and the morality of honoring debt debts runs very deep, in fact, so deep you could call it a civil religion, just the idea of you know, refusing debts is, is such a taboo. It's up there along with the incest taboo, basically. Um, and there's such a massive wall of moralism around debt, uh, both on the left as well as the right, 
But uh, thanks to David and others, we, we become aware, I think, and largely through Occupy, of the double standard around this uh, issue. On Wall Street, they have no trouble refusing debts and renegotiating debts and writing off debts on any day of the week. Uh, this is something that's, that's, that's daily practice. Um, so the morality of honoring debts is for the little people. Remember Leona Helmsley said that only the little people pay taxes. It's a wonderful quote. Um, so, uh, so I'm happy to talk more about that concept um, and, and some of our experience of, uh, of uh, responses to the campaign of debt refusal uh, in Q&A. And just to end, I would say that, again, returning to the title of the panel, The Future of Occupy, um, no one can say that this one thing or that one thing is what Occupy stands for, but at least we should acknowledge that if, or insofar as the 1%, 99% slogan is now firmly lodged in the public mind as perhaps the, you know, the most considerable achievement of Occupy so far, it's our responsibility to push much further, to push the public understanding much further than simply a recognition that there is an uneven wealth distribution in the country. It's our responsibility to explain the means by which wealth gets redistributed. And unless we succeed in doing that, then I think we might be faced with, uh, with a Don Fabrizio scenario whereby uh, uh, the plutocrats have, have recognized and adopted this principle that in order for them to be able to enjoy things the way they are, then things may have to change, but just a little bit. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me in back there? So I'm Nick Miosov. Uh, I, I work when I when I'm academic. I work on visual culture. Uh, in Occupy, I've been working in a variety of contexts at a much less distinguished level than either of these guys on on, on either side of me. Um, and but I, I recognise a number of faces around the room. It's nice to see you here. Um, and uh, I wanted to say a few things about how working inside. Uh, Occupy in the mill ranks, if you like, uh, might be thought in relation to uh, the intellectual work that I try to do. Um, one of the things I was thinking in relation to this question of the future of Occupy is what kind of future might we imagine and what kind of paths might we draw on in order to construct a visualization of that future. Uh, and it's very striking to notice that in the contemporary political context, we're asked to make one strong recognition and one strong denial. We're asked to recognize that so-called austerity is required of us, that we must all purge ourselves of, uh, of the things that we might wish to claim to, whether as nation states or as individuals. We're also asked to deny that there is such a thing as climate change. We're asked to deny that the planet has been substantially affected by uh, the 250 years of industrial capitalism even in a winter where I walked past a cherry tree in blossom today <laughs> in New York on February the 20th. And we've seen those two things are not unconnected. What I would like to try and suggest is that in order to imagine a future for Occupy, one of the things we might try and do would be create a vision where one of the things that seems so powerful to me about the movement is its ability to bring things together that are very often kept separate. So that we would think about, in the same mental framework, the place of rejecting austerity, but also accepting the necessity to come to terms with globalized climate change. And if we thought about it in that context, we start to see that the Occupy movement that's been very local to us here in New York is part of a much broader global movement that became visible, of course, our first in Tunisia, then in Egypt, and more recently around the world. And so I'd very briefly like to just, you know, think about that uh, in terms of a different kind of accumulation and debt then. So that every time in the last 250 years that capitalism has invested in an industrial process, it hopefully creates for itself a profit, sometimes a loss, as we all know. But it also accumulates a deficit in the environment, which has been measurable. And it's indexical, and it has risen steadily since 1750, to our present crisis level of about 394 parts per million 
of carbon dioxide and its equivalents. And you're now at a state where the International Energy Authority, who are no bunch of occupiers, these are the guys that run power stations, did a calculation that showed that the number of power stations that are already intended to be built will use up all the capacity that we have left to expand carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide emissions to remain within a 2% excuse me, a two degree raise in temperature by the end of the century. That's already a very dangerous level. And that will expire by 2017. So one of the things that only Occupy can do, because only we are going to make this case, is that an economy needs to be rebuilt, not just for the benefit of the 1%, but the 99% globally, who demand the right to occupy the places that they live. Many of those islands and low-lying countries are already under threat, in the Pacific, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, and in other regions of the world that don't make all the news that's fit to print. But as soon as this process accelerates, it's going to hit places like California, Florida, and indeed Manhattan. And in a few years, we won't be debating who has the right to occupy Zuccotti because it'll be underwater. <laughs> and I want to just very briefly uh, suggest that part of the reason that we're in the contemporary crisis and political moment of resistance that we are it's precisely that this has already begun to impact people worldwide. And the food crisis that began in 2008 worldwide was directly indexed to two things. On the one hand, uh, the conversion of food production to biofuels, an ironic unintended consequence of a supposedly good project. The corn was previously going to food was being converted to ethanol. Uh, but at the same time, a worldwide drought uh, that was directly, of course, caused by climate change. And you see a bunch of folks downtown see an opportunity here. Goldman Sachs, yes, it's them, set up uh, a thing that's called the Commodity Futures Index. And this allows for people in Wall Street to speculate on the price of food. And it has a particular little trick to it. The price of food is only ever allowed to go up in the Commodities Futures Index. And this is the future that they imagine, right? Uh, and what we've seen over the last several years uh, is that companies like all the usual suspects, Barclays, Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan Chase, AIG, all these folks, have been pouring money into the Commodities Futures Index because the regular equities, as we all know, haven't been doing so great. So in the first 50 days of 2008, about $50 billion moved out of equities into commodities. That's at about $300 billion uh, more recently. And what that has led to is a remarkable acceleration of food price inflation. And we've seen that locally, but it's been far more dramatic in the underdeveloped world. So this has meant that in the underdeveloped world, there's been something like an 80% price rise in the cost of food from 2003 to the present. So that means if you're a person, as about half the world's population is, who lives on about $2 a day or less, 50% of your costs of living it's food anyway. So if that's gone up by 80% in the last couple of years, your whole life is no longer feasible. And if you understand that, you begin to understand one of the reasons that we've seen uh, such dramatic resistance to authoritarianism in Egypt in particular, and obviously uh, around the world uh, in the last while. And it was in 2009 that we hit the index score level of one billion people below the United Nations official level for hunger. And that's going to be a lot less food than most of us are accustomed to. So we need to recognize that all of us are in a global 1% uh, in relation to those people. But it's up to us as the 5% of the population that consumes 25% of the world's carbon emissions to take responsibility for that uh, and to think about what we might do uh, in response to this. We should note that the one meter sea level rise that's predicted to hit by the end of the century, and that's a very conservative figure most people now think, will completely obliterate the entire Nile Delta. And all the people living uh, in that region will have to find uh, alternative places to live. And finally, in, the, in this kind of sorry genealogy, one should remember that Zuccotti Park is owned by Brookfield Properties, or in turn, owned by a company called Trans Canada, who want to bring the Keystone Pipeline through the US to sell some of the most 
intensely toxic oil that will ever be extracted uh, from the, underneath the planet. And James Hansen is the NASA scientist who first coined the idea of global warming. He has said that if we start doing that, it's game over for the planet. So we're going to need to think uh, in a very different set of contexts. We're going to need to think about sustainability, not just as a nice, cuddly, green idea, but as our modality of, of an economy. And we're, we're going to be able to be supported in that by an over 200-year history of people who have claimed autonomy and have always seen sustainability uh, as part of what they want. So uh, in my book, which was kindly referred to earlier on, I didn't know it was going to be here, but it's over there, um, I do talk about this history, and I won't go into it in great detail here, except just to indicate you know, one of those measures, which right early in the anti-slavery revolution in Haiti uh, in 1801, the subalterns rose up in revolt against their own revolution, against Toussaint, to try and secure for themselves small patches of land that they could cultivate amongst themselves what we would now call sustainably. And Toussaint doesn't do that. He puts down that revolt very violently, killing his own nephew in the process. Why? Because he has to repay his debt to the United States, which he has borrowed in order to sustain the war. So these histories then have a long genealogy that we can tap into, both on our side, on the side uh, of autonomy, and on the, uh, on the other side, as it were. And I think, you know, Occupy should know that we're the only people that are going to think this future. The future that's being thought on the other side is a willingness, in this new phrase that's circulating, been resurrected from the grave of Andrew W. Mellon, to liquidate everything. So in response, we can only, of course, say over and again, occupy everything. Okay. Um, wow. Thank you for that. You know, it's very nice to sort of put a perspective on, on, on the size of things that we're dealing with here, because I think that you know, one of the most pernicious effects of the last 30 years or so of you know, what has come to be seen as common sense parameters for, you know, political conversation is that we've basically been taught that it's impossible to think on uh, any sort of large scale about change. I mean, um, it sometimes seems that the people running the world system are willing, the only thing they're willing to make heroic efforts for is is not to change things. Um, you know, which people like Obama, you know, seem to like be, you know, willing to move heaven and earth to, like, maintain things more or less as they are before, even when they all seem to be on the brink of crumbling. But actually changing anything is, is almost out of, out of bounds. Um, despite this, um, it's interesting to be able to talk about the future of, of Occupy. So I really don't know. Um, it, I was so taken by surprise by the success of the thing to begin with, that I mean, I feel that I, I spent so much of the summer thinking, oh no, we're all going to just get beaten up and put in jail and no one's ever going to know. And, um, and it was such a staggering success, I've, I've just given up on my predictive powers. Um, but um, uh, so I'll say this. Um, I sometimes take inspiration in Emanuel Wallerstein's idea that all revolutions since 1789 have really been world revolutions. Um, it started an argument about the French Revolution. Someone tried to argue the French Revolution might not have been as historically significant as as we think, because if you look at Denmark between 1750 and 1850, it might well have changed more than France itself, to which Wallerstein, of course, replied, yeah, but would Denmark have changed had it not been for the French Revolution? Um, in fact, the effects of revolutions might be more profound in places where we don't think they even happened. Um, argument that was essentially once you have a world economic system, all revolutions are revolutions within that system as a whole. And sure enough, I mean, you it makes sense once you start looking at things that way. Uh, the revolution of 1848, of course, didn't seize power anywhere, but, you know, they saw insurrections everywhere from Bratislava to Yucatan. Um, you have Russian Revolution having in a way more profound effects on places like the United States and Western Europe than it did in even in Russia, perhaps. Um, you have um, the world revolution of 
1968, as, as Wallerstein calls it, um, which, again, didn't seize power anywhere, but totally transformed the terms uh, of political debate. And, and his other key argument was that um, what revolutions really do is they change our political common sense. That's how you know when you're in the presence of a revolution. Uh, and there again, the French Revolution is a paradigm because um, you know, there were ideas that in, say, 1750 were just considered basically lunatic fringe by almost everyone, that by 1850, anyone who was, you know, aspired to intellectual respectability, had to at least pay lip service to. Um, you know, one of those was that social change is good. Another one, yeah, I mean, was, people thought that was crazy talk in 1750. Um, you know, social change is good. The appropriate institution to direct social change is, some, is the government, and governments gain legitimacy through something called the people. Um, essentially, those are the sort of change of common sense brought about by the French Revolution. Um, and... He said, this is the first time it even looks like some of those assumptions are beginning to be questioned. We might have a, a similar epical shift in common sense. So, you know, as soon as um, Occupy Wall Street began and there were all these um, things happening and Occupy KwaZulu Natal, there were protests in China, so forth and so on, I, I, I wrote him an email and I said, so we talking revolu World Revolution of 2011? And he was like, yeah. So, um, of course, he's, he's a notorious optimist, but so am I. So I thought, okay, let's ride with this. Um, there is a world revolution going on, and our basic political common sense is in the process of transformation. Um, how might it be doing so? Uh, interesting question, um, what it's ultimately going to mean. But I think that one way to put it in perspective what's going on is precisely the... the, the we're in a situation where that habit we have of always thinking small and assuming all the sort of big questions have been answered is pretty much over. Um, I mean, we're so out of the habit that it's going to take us a while to start doing it again. Um, but, you know, the stakes are there, as, as you point out. We kind of have to. Um, and and I've been thinking about this for some years, actually. And, and one of the conclusions I made, and this takes off on, on something Andrew said that I think is really true about student loans, uh, that, that what we've been experiencing over the last 30 years is really best described as a kind of war against the human imagination. I mean, that's what neoliberalism really is. Um, neoliberalism is the obsession with the political over the economic. It's exactly the opposite of what it pretends to be. Um, but in this way, I think it's a profoundly, profoundly dishonest ideology. Um, and oddly enough, it, it first occurred to me um, during an IMF protest in 2002, I think, one of those ones nobody even remembers anymore. We were completely overwhelmed by cops. Um, it was very demoralizing. But um, the thing about it was... Um, I came out of it very demoralized until I talked to someone I knew who was friends with someone who had actually gone to the meeting. Um, and they were saying, well, you know, it was you think it was demoralizing for you, you have no idea. Like, they basically had to cancel the entire thing. There were checkpoints everywhere. There are thousands of cops. All the parties are canceled, and that's where they actually get things done. All the ceremonies, like, they had to give up. You know, it sucked. Most people just did it and didn't even go and did it on computers. Um, so I thought... Wow. So basically what happened was we did shut down the meetings, but um, we shut down the meetings because the police were so obsessed by not letting us feel that we'd done anything in the streets that they shut down the meetings for us. Um, <laughs> because it's much more important to them that we feel bad than that the meetings actually take place. Well, think about that. Uh, they think we're really important, don't they? I mean, they're planning their entire strategy around making us depressed. Um, <laughs> and I started like, well, what if you imagine everything they do that way? You know, what if these guys are just completely obsessed with the danger of social m uh, movements? That's what they organize everything around. Well, that would explain a lot. And then I thought about the, the war, right? I mean, why do they have such bizarre way of fighting the war? Create turns of engagement, which, you know, are almost guaranteed they're going to lose. And it's, oh, they're so obsessed with not having an effective anti-war movement. They've, they've done this analysis. We must get over the Vietnam syndrome. This is how they put it to themselves, right? Um... 
you know, they had such effective opposition to Vietnam that we haven't been allowed to have a war in 30 years. Now we can finally do it. Let's make sure we, well, you know, they don't take it away from us again. How are we going to do that? Um, so, you know, they have this idea of body count versus protest. We have to make sure that no, very few American soldiers get killed. So they create these terms of engagement, which just slaughter people randomly all over the place. And as a, you know, as a result, make everybody so mad at them that they lose the war. And they kind of know that. Uh, but it's like the IMF protests. They don't care. What really they care is that we can't mobilize and effectively oppose them. So they don't it doesn't really matter if they win the war. Um, so if you apply that logic over and over again, I mean, it explains almost everything about neoliberalism. I mean, even take something like precarious labor. Um, there's every reason to believe that precarious labor arrangements are not particularly efficient economically, um, but they're incredibly efficient in depoliticizing labor. Same thing with increasing working hours. Um, in a way, if you think about it, they're cre creating these huge security. Another example, actually, I'll throw this one out. Um, when the Soviet Union collapses, you'd think if these guys were honest about, you know, what they really wanted to do in uh, fighting the Cold War, what they would do is re rebuild the economy and get rid of the army and K Red Army and KGB, right? Instead, they leave the army and KGB and they get rid of the economy. <laughs> well, why is that? Well, it's because this maintaining a geological hegemony is much more important than having an economy. It's all about political control. Um, and, um, you know, as, as long as the Army and KGB is working on their side, it's, we like them. Um, so it seems to me that what they've done is put all of their eggs in the political basket. That essentially what they've decided is that, you know, anytime you have a choice between doing something that makes capitalism seem like it's the only conceivable political system, um, and any sort of oppositional movement is inherently, you know, can't possibly work, is inherently depressing and disappointing. You know, so uh, a choice between something that makes capitalism seem the only system and something that makes capitalism actually be a viable long-term economic system, they always choose the former. So we're in this paradoxical situation where the system, they're basically destroyed the system so as to make it seem like the only thing that could possibly work. So we're all sitting here, you know, find, you know, the only battle they've actually won is the war of the imagination. So we're all sitting here watching the thing crumble, and so, but, but it's the only thing that could possibly work, and it's falling apart. <laughs> what are we going to do? Um, Hence, I think this, what this revolution is doing is breaking the hold of that ideology. The question is how we go from there to something that will actually be of immediate concrete benefit to people's lives. Um, I mean, from changing the grounds of discussion, the conversation, as people have said, which I think is going to only snowball as time goes on. Once you start opening these things up, um, imagination will become reborn in all sorts of forms we can now not anticipate. But, um, but you know, what is that going to mean to all those people who are hungry, who are the people in America who are just in absolutely desperate situations, um, for whom, you know, in a lot of ways, um, you know, since the revolution started, things have gotten even worse uh, in their terms of immediate conditions of life. Um, and and I've, I've given this a bit of thought. I've actually just... Uh, I had read a chapter um, of sort of practical thoughts on on um, for a, a, a book I'm doing. I, I, I finished chapter four, by the way. So, <laughs> um, so I've just been working on this. Um, and one of the things I, I, I did was um, I was going through other what has worked in other places, and obviously, you know, every. Every time you do this, you're in a completely different political balance of forces, different cultural, um, so, social traditions, um, which bear on things in very different ways. But I think it's possible to kind of come up with a list of possibilities of how other people have, have, have balanced the problem, which is basically what the problem of Occupy Wall Street has, between creating a s autonomous space where you're experimenting with new forms of democracy, with new forms of social arrangement, and which necessarily has to be, you know, protected in some way by some kinds of firewall from entanglement and the very corrupt structures of power it's trying to expose. Um, and influencing them in some way which will be immediately of benefit to others, um, which is kind of the big political question of the day. I mean, basically what we're talking about is a kind of dual power theory. 
Um, it doesn't seem that way because the power exercised by groups of Occupy Wall Street isn't military, uh, and you know. But it's 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 there's a reason that we're using the word Occupy here. Uh, in a way, it is a balance of forces. It's just a balance of different kinds of forces. I remember hearing, uh, for example, talking to Jeff Charlotte actually. Um, who, a reporter who's spent a lot of time talking to people on both sides, but he, he interviewed a lot of the police officials and city officials who were involved in making the immediate decision about whether to evict people from Zuccotti Park and decided not to. And I was um, startled by this, but it makes perfect sense when you think about it. One of their major considerations that these guys had in deciding not to to um, immediately evict was the presence of all those guys in the Guy Fox masks because they were all convinced that if they did evict them, Anonymous would hack their personal credit cards and bank accounts and make their life a living hell. <laughs> you know, I mean, actually, they can't really do most of those things they do in the movies, but that's good that they didn't know that. Um, there always has to be some kind of counterpower, um, some you know, even spectral threat that you can produce in their minds, whether it's moral, whether it's political. Um, whether it's electronic. Um, so you have an occupation, you have some kind of dual power situation, what can you do? Um, and I came up with four possible models. One could be the, 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 the Sadr City model, if you home geographically. One might be the Chiapas San Andre, uh, Andres Accord model. Um, one could be the El Alto model, and one could be the Argentina model. Um, so I will throw this out what as was the third one, uh, the um, Chiapas uh, San Andres Accord. Oh, the, uh, oh, the third. Oh, El Alto in Bolivia. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I just wrote this today, so let's see if this works. Um, all right, number one. I actually found the Sadras in Iraq very fascinating. I mean, obviously, we're not going to actually form an armed militia, but nonetheless, um, their approach was ingenious in a lot of ways um, because what they understood is if you want to create a liberated territory, what you do is you start by creating something nobody could possibly object to, and then you build an infrastructure around that. So did people know what they actually did? What they did was they created a series of free clinics for pregnant women and nursing mothers, um, and you know, which is filling an obvious large gap in government services and, and was like clearly totally benevolent. No one could really object to it. And then they created you know, an army around it to protect it. Um, and um, they did this by you know, creating clear zones and saying to the American soldiers, like, we'll never fire on you if you don't go off these streets, but we will if, as soon as you go here. And you know, they tried to negotiate. It, it sort of worked and it sort of didn't, but they create, managed to create autonomous spaces built up around starting with something which was itself utterly morally unobject uh, unobjectionable. Um, and, and in a sense, that's the same strategy that Hezbollah pursued in Lebanon. It's, it, it was very effective in creating a dual power situation. The pitfall, it seems to me, is that when you create those zones, how do you prevent yourself from turning into a formal political movement? Because that's what has turned happened with movements like that. Um, they almost invariably end up unable to resist the temptation to just become the local government, and then once you're the local government, how can you keep yourself on the local level? They move on to become an actual political party. They often tend to um, represent one particular identity group of some kind or another within the country. So, so while it's interesting and illustrative, you know, it, it illustrates pitfalls as much as anything else. So then I thought about, let's see, um, model number two was the... Um, what the Zapatistas did. And it's fascinating in a lot of ways. A lot of it kind of was improvised and unintentional. Um, and to some degree, you know, what the Zapatista uprising did in 1994, uh, just starting on January 1st, they had what was effectively a 12-day military uprising. And this is an area where traditionally, you know, if you want to do nonviolent direct action, you just get killed. You know? um, so essentially what they did is they had an uprising, stopped it as soon as they possibly could, and um, buried the guns in play on an undisclosed location and said, well, we still have the guns, but they're buried now. Now will you let us do nonviolent direct action? Um, and created autonomous communities. Uh, so they want a space in which they could engage in a type of, of, of nonviolent warfare, effectively, that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Um, but what I thought was particularly interesting was they were able to 
use negotiations with the government. I mean, there's a, bit, a big question when you're setting up a liberated space is how you do engage with the government. Unlike groups like the Sadrists or Hezbollah, they didn't join the political process. They wanted to make it clear that the existing political structure is inherently corrupt. Um, we don't want to compromise with it. We don't want to be part of it. We want to create an alternative form of real democracy. Um, however, you have to engage with it somehow. So what they settled on was a, a, a peace process. They ended up um, negotiating a treaty with the government. The government was negotiating in bad faith. They, they pretty much knew the government was negotiating in bad faith and would never enforce the treaty. In a way, it didn't matter. Uh, because, because they had this peace treaty being negotiated, there was a truce. It opened up a space. And it gave them an excuse to develop these really elaborate, directly democratic experimental forms in order to negotiate the treaties, since they had recallable delegates that had to bring everything back for consensus process on different levels to the community. So they actually used the negotiation with the government as a way of fostering their own uh, internal democratic process rather than compromising it. So that was one really interesting model. Um, and, you know, I guess a parallel to that, if we were to try to do that, would be a constitutional amendment or something like that. Because there are people saying, that, well, you could bypass the actual electoral politicians' politics and go straight for something else, and we could use that as an actual excuse to maintain rather than subvert. I don't know if it would work, but there's a thought. Um, a third approach might be... David, yes. David, um, yeah. El Alto. Um, okay, yeah, sure. Um, People want to ask questions. Yeah, sure. Um, third approach would be the El Alto approach where you maintain your directly democratic uh, process and uh, put your own guy in power and threaten to kick him out any moment through an, a popular uprising. Uh, we're not quite up to there yet. <laughs> um, but the point is you don't enter electoral politics until you've legitimated the idea of using um, very, very militant direct action means. Um, and the fourth one is utter delegitimization. And that was the Argentine approach. You create uh, alternative institutions and their slogan was basically, in case I told us, it, it translates to they can all go to hell. You, you, you get it to the point where politicians like can't go to restaurants without wearing disguises or you'll throw food at them. Um, and, um, you know, it's what's happening in Greece right now. That's incredibly effective because what you're basically saying, it's up to you to prove that you have any reason to call yourselves our representatives. We utterly reject you. And then you can get the government to do incredibly radical things all of their own accord while not compromising your own experiment. <laughs> Okay, um, <laughs> I, was, I was actually going to ask you to tell us, what? before the question period, which of these four models uh, you see applying to uh, the here and now. Well, at the moment, we're doing delegitimation, obvious, but we're already halfway there because most, got, most people in America already hate politicians. Um, so that's a kind of a no-brainer. Uh, the question is whether we continue on that or whether we attempt um, one of the other three. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, um, the floor is, uh, is yours. So um, anyone who has a question uh, for any of the panelists? Yeah, and now I'm gonna, re we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna repeat the question. Go ahead. Andrew. Andrew? Yes. Okay, uh, I, I have no, I know some people who signed the petition. Have you gotten up to a million yet? Sorry? Have you gotten up to a million signatures yet? Or where you Not quite. Repeat the question. Not quite. No, that's, an, that's, another, that's another campaign. Um, <clears throat> there are lots of other campaigns in, this, in the student debt field. Uh, most of them are aimed at reform. Uh, small reforms, I would say. Most of them are aimed at restoring some of the uh, consumer protections that are denied to student debtors, including the right to declare bankruptcy. They haven't really gotten very far. Um, oh, sure, that makes so much more sense. Um, they ha none of these campaigns have really gotten very far. And what we see in, on Capitol Hill is, you know, sort of elaborate dancing around the rim of a volcano. Um, is the way I think about it. Uh, every so often our president, you know, gives a speech in which he announces a few uh, adjustments, not even structural adjustments, but very slight adjustments to programs and, and, and really this is uh, um, kind of unacceptable. Um, so our, our campaign was more in the Occupy spirit of, you know, not making demands on the political process, but uh, tying the campaign to basic moral principles. One being that uh, public education should be, uh, <clears throat> uh, 
should be free, uh, like other many other countries in the world, uh, all of them less affluent than the U.S., uh, which make it the national priority to uh, to fund higher education. We should rejoin that list. And we estimated it wouldn't cost uh, the federal government more than $70 billion a year if they paid for all of the tuition at every two- and four-year public college in the country, which is a very small slice of the federal budget. Uh, if you consider uh, a recent audit found that $70 billion was the amount that was wasted by the Pentagon every year in unaccountable spending alone. So what the Pentagon wastes would produce a free public education system at the, in, at the tertiary level in this country. And, and so we think, we think there's a moral imperative to do that. We also, another principle is that student loans should be interest-free. Uh, they shouldn't be regarded in the same way as consumer loans are, and certainly by the federal government. Now, there's some evidence that the federal government is using revenue from student loans to pay down the national debt, which is particularly immoral, um, given given the you know the wars that we've that we've gone into in order to to rack up that national debt. And and, and another principle is that private universities, over which we have very little leverage, um, uh, at least three of us here at NYU, the, the nearest of those private universities, uh, we think they should adopt fiscal transparency and, uh, um, and, uh, and open their books. On the topic of which, let me put a plug in for a rally that our campaign is doing tomorrow at 1 o'clock at NYU. Uh, it does it does relate to um, not just to NYU but to a lot of downtown Manhattan because the NYU administration is proposing a six billion dollar expansion plan uh, to expand the physical footprint of the university by forty percent and most of that's going to be built in in the Washington Square Village area and <clears throat> because the administration is not fiscally transparent. Uh, they won't tell us what their business plan is. <laughs> How do you borrow six billion dollars in the current economic climate? No one is saying. Um, but I think we've reached the conclusion that, the, that this will be funded through student debt. And NYU is already number one in the country in student debt. It can't go higher in the national rankings. But <laughs> if the plan goes ahead, the debt will certainly get much higher. So we're, we're doing a rally uh, that includes lots of different voices from different sectors at 1 o'clock tomorrow in front of the Stern School of Business, Washington Square South. Um, for anyone who wants to come along, it will be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question. I, I found your theory about that college games like an indentured servanthood. To kind of defend the colleges, I do remember television commercials from the 70s where the colleges were predicting that tuition was going to go up and up and up and up, and I forgot what they, why the purpose of the commercials were for, but it seems to me that the universe, universities foresaw this. So that, and from, my, from what I remember, that would go against your theory of the indentured servanthood. Boy. From those commercials that I remember from the 70s, they were trying to warn people that the tuition was going to go sky high. I repeat the question succinctly yeah, before I fill it down. We have to repeat the question. If you can, repeat the question. Whoever's going to answer. It. Okay. <laughs> this, this, uh, uh, the, 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 question, the questioner was a recalling uh, uh, advertisements in the 1970s on the part of colleges warning about the impending rise in, in, in tuition. Um, uh, I, this I, means you're wrong. I was not I was not aware of the, that advertising <laughs> campaign, but uh, but I think you know the, the equivalent of it today is is uh, the zeal with which and in this state there's there's something called uh, I can't remember what it's called it's the college um, you know the state runs this college savings fund you know for 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 parents of, of future college students to pay into a, a, what is it called Coverdale, Coverdale? Coverdale? I don't know what it's called. The 529? 529. Right. So the state already has a system that, that reinforces and legitimates the idea of future debt. Yeah. So you're already paying into this the, 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 the system that, 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 that is uh, 
that is based on the wages of the future, you know, 30 or 40 years before these wages are earned. It's an extraordinarily, highly, highly over-leveraged uh, piece of political economy, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, we might compare the experience of other places where the same things have happened um, in different ways. Uh, it, you, what's happening in the UK right now, uh, I was involved in the uh, student movement last year in the UK, and it's remarkable because they haven't had a student loan system there, they're actually creating one. And it becomes very clear what's going on when you see it like first created. Um, essentially, you know, because the British education system already, you know, trains people in three years about as well as we do in four for a third of the money. Um, so they're not in a, you know, crisis of uh, inefficiency. Um, however, it, you know, what, what happened as soon um, the first there was this thing called the Brown Report that was issued by a Labour government, which had like um, first introduced um, sort of three thousand pound tuition fees, which had never it had been free before. Um, the Brown Report sort of decided that nobody would ever possibly go to college except to increase their average life income expectation. Um, they had this totally neoliberal model, um, and you know proposed various reforms based on this assumption. And as soon as the, the conservative government came in, the first thing they did was triple tuition fees and then give everybody student loans, which basically meant that people had no choice but to act like the guys in the Brown Report um, were, were assumed to be hey, behaving. You know, every single student occupation started the same way. Their first declaration was a rejection of the very terms of the debate, saying, you know, education is not an economic good. We're not here, you know, to further our economic interests. We're here to learn stuff because it's good. Um, so, so, I mean, it's a more clear example of just an explicitly political idea of the uh, political attack on the very idea of education um, as as a value in itself could hardly be imagined. And it came at a very telling time um, because it came right in the wake of this financial collapse where basically everybody had been told all these questions are settled, as I was saying, you know, this war on the imagination. I think it can be explained perfectly in terms of that. You know, we just said, everybody's saying, well, look, these guys might be assholes, but they're, only, they're the only guys who know how to run an economy. Uh, they, they, they figured everything out. It's all fine. Just do what you're told. You know, it turned out they're a bunch of idiots and scam artists. And like, you know, so uh, what was their first political reaction to attack universities, which is the only place we're allowed to think in, in terms of other systems of value and about other things? It was, and, and submit it to the very economic logic that had so spectacularly failed. <laughs> Can I just add the, the one counter example, and, and it's, a, it's a tale of stirring resistance in the UK is the Scottish university system, which is, which is still free. Yeah. Uh, it's running against the grain of, of the English model now, and there's, an immen there's immense popular support in Scotland among the populace for, for keeping higher education free. Uh, that runs very, very deep and is kind of symptomatic of, of, of what, you, what you can actually inculcate in a country, uh, not a very affluent country at all, which, uh, which makes this a priority. And we know in this country, higher education used to be more of a national priority than it is today for all sorts of reasons. Hi. Um, I uh, well, firstly, uh, thanks Dave for mentioning the uh, UK student movement because um, I've, I've been involved in that for some time. Uh, it's I, I really it's, it's uh, rare to hear it mentioned in the context of OWS and other associated movements, but for a lot of people, particularly in Europe, that's where the ideas began. Um, I wanted to draw attention back to the very first thing that was said on this panel, which is a uh, an apology for the makeup of the panel, uh, which is uh, all white, all male, all over 30, I, I'm assuming all over 30, but I'm more than just to say that. And uh, it was, uh, there's an apology that I've already heard uh, on at least three different panels I've, I've watched this year, which is, oh, you know, we tried, but, you know, we couldn't, couldn't find anything. And if we're talking here, um, if the crisis here is a lack of political imagination, should we not start with ourselves? Should we not, is there not, like, we're, we're, sitting, we're sitting here, you know, with, the problem is, is apparently a lack of imagination, but here we are still sitting, you know, in a discussion of the future of what is the largest, on 
honest to God, countercultural movement we've seen for generations, and we're sitting here listening to four middle-aged guys tell us what, what's going to happen. I'm sorry. I could, you know, if you, if you couldn't find a woman or a person of colour or a young person to tell you about where these, this movement is heading, then you haven't looked hard enough. I could end, I, I'm not even from New York, as you can hear, and I can name you a dozen young women of colour who could have been on this panel and told you some things. So I think we should check ourselves. We, whatever we is, whatever the we that we're talking about. Okay, mm -hmm. I hear you. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Yes, indeed. The, the question was, why, why did I lie <laughs> when I said that we tried to find people to vary the makeup of the panel? Because uh, the questioner has been to three or four panels where she heard people say the same thing. This year. That's amazing. I mean, I'll, you know, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to embarrass anybody by explaining what happened. Uh, but it wasn't that we couldn't find people. Mm -hmm. We did ask them, and for various reasons, they couldn't make it. Okay, <laughs> honest to God, I, I have never lied to you, and I'm not <laughs> lying to you now. But I, your point is well taken. Okay, <clears throat> yeah. Go ahead. Oh, um, two <clears throat> questions and one comment um, <clears throat> about the student debt. Do we know um, if any or any significant amount of the student debt has been securitized? Um, Three hundred billion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of what percentage of that? What is, what is that as a percentage of the? Is that, you got to repeat the question because really? this is ambiguous. Whoever's going to answer. It. Oh, uh, the question was. I'm not going to answer it, um, but I'll repeat it. Um, the question was um, of the total student loan debt. What is the percentage that has been securitized? And there has already been a suggestion from the audience that it's about uh, four hundred billion and, and thirty percent. Yeah, yeah. So it is somewhat transparent, then, if you came up that quickly with a, with a number. That's, yeah. That's interesting. Um, and do we know what, how much of this is no longer, of the student debt is no longer government guaranteed, or is most all of it still government guaranteed even if it's private? Uh, the the yeah. question is about the percentage that is government guaranteed. Well, the, a lot of student loans were government guaranteed, but until a few years ago, they were they were served directly serviced by uh, by private corporations. Eighty percent of student loans now originate with the federal government, um, but the rate of increase. Uh, among the, the the volume of loans that are made by the private sector is much greater annually. So it may be that in 15, 20 years' time, there'll be more loans that originate in, in the private sector. And they're the ones that carry the much higher rates of interest. That said, the federal loans still carry very high rates of interest. I mean, much higher than, than mortgage, uh, than equi mortgage equity rates of interest. So this, I mean, this could well be a new bubble. You know, it, it, I mean, if there's a significant amount of securitization resting on those loans and it's government guaranteed, you know. You should repeat that, that's a good point. Lends a sort of, you know, degree of um, um, safety or apparent safety to those, you know, passing on the securitized um, debt obligations. And you could, since there really isn't much transparency at this point, it could be the next big bubble. Yeah, the, the, the question or the observation is about the, the impending uh, student debt bubble, about which there's been a lot of commentary and, and certainly a lot of interest from sectors of the finance industry. Um, you know, there are particular, particular sectors that have an interest in stoking the idea of particular bubbles. <laughs> Uh, I haven't done much research on it, but I, 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 at one point I did follow up a trail of, uh, of uh, alarm signals that were being generated about the so-called student debt bu bubble and found most of them originated among uh, uh, gold traders, um, people who were, who were very interested in, in, in persuading people to switch their uh, investments into gold. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, tr it's a trick, it's a, it's a minefield. Uh, in a way, when people start talking about a bubble uh, in, in this particular sector, I think you, you really have to literally follow the money uh, and, and figure out who's, um, 
who has an interest in 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 um, in amplifying the dimensions of the bubble? Mm -hmm. well, could I just one one uh, quick comment? And that was what, when you said that there were two sort of uh, strands in, in, in the student debt e effort. I mean, one was the high moral, you know, the moral ground, the moral statement without demands. I think it's really important that there also be, as you said, actual concrete, you know steps to, to redress you know, changes, that that's not insignificant, that's really important because, and I don't think they contradict each other. Um. Um, again, the, the, the observation was that uh, it, uh, in addition to our more, uh, our high, the high moral ground of our campaign, that there ought to be more reform-minded campaigns and, and that, they're, that they're very important too. And, and, and I certainly agree with that. Um, and, uh, um, but I, I would add some of the other campaigns have not been hospitable to our entry onto the scene. Onto the scene. <laughs> no, no, I was just pointing. There's one, two people with their hands up for a long time. <laughs> I can handle this. Okay. Yeah. Um, David, it's good to say that uh, we're in a process, a moment of delegitimization, and that already most politicians are already delegitimized. And I'm, I'm wondering about the, uh, a lot's been written, but the, the fact that in that delegitimization, some people can go towards Occupy Wall Street and some people can go towards uh, Tea Party and fascism and, and how this delegitimization, which is a good thing, you know, end up getting played out. And I guess I wanted to, to ask our colleague in the middle, um, in the terms of the climate denial, about Naomi Klein's article, where, she, you know, she suggested that um, it, the, the deniers are probably more accurate in understanding that this whole capitalist system is completely unviable in terms of sustainability and they get it. And it's the liberals who are trying to, you know, keep the thing propped up um, so that there's, I don't know if they're so connected or not, but I think that, um, that, that uh, I have a question about the delegitimization and also um, the fact that sometimes the, it's the deniers who get who, who get the fact that this system, it, it, we would really be talking about changing the whole system uh, if we were honest. Do you have a question? I, I'd like to hear some comment around that debate and some comment about delegitimization and, and how this can veer towards Tea Party and fascism as well as it can veer towards OWS. Yeah, well, I mean, the obvious... Wait, wait, repeat, you know. repeat the question. Oh, the question is, um, would not a delegitimization strategy play equally into the hands of right-wing fascist-type people? Um, and, um, uh, yeah, that's the only thing you do. But I, I, I thought I made it clear that, that what we're talking about is a dual-power strategy where you are creating alternative institutions and how do you affect policy if you are trying to maintain your autonomy from them, like setting an example of what an actual democratic system or actual viable economic system so forth and so on would be like um, so that uh, I mean clearly the great fear that that you know liberals have is they they are convinced that people are actually are evil and irrational and like like without you know even though government is corrupt without it like they'd be just as soon veer to you know scary ideologies as to reasonable ones um, I mean I guess if you really think that's the case then yeah, you might as well, you know, stick with pointing a gun at everybody's head. I, I actually, you know, uh, um, of the broader philosophical opinion that when people behave in su such ways as you would think they would all become, you know, Hobbesian, crazy, or fascist, um, if the gun was removed, that behavior is actually caused by the gun itself. Um, that's why I'm an anarchist. But, um, uh, you know, I, one can... I, I was going to say you can't prove it one way or the other. Actually, I, th I personally think you can. I mean, you know, uh, we have seen what happens when governments dissolve, and it's usually not what's anticipated. Um, but um, I, in, in a larger sense, the direct answer is um, it's not just a delegitimization process. It's using the delegitimization process as a sort of um, aggressive aspect of what is also a process of building a, a compelling alternative. Oh, I'm sorry. What? Did you want to say something? I want to say, I want, I want to say something quickly mm -hmm. to what, what you had said, but I also mm -hmm. want to address the question which was brought up over here about the makeup of this panel, because mm -hmm. I did try and invite some folks, and they didn't want to come, because <laughs> they don't want to be the token person. 
<laughs> so, which I think is fair. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, it, you know, it really, like all of these things, it does start at the beginning. You have to, you can't add this on later where you go, oops, that's not, I agree with you. It's not an appropriate response. Um, and, you know, maybe we should not have accepted the invitation. Why are you not, um, why, why are you not inviting the women first? I wasn't well, in charge not, of the invitations. Well, as, as, as you as in, like the people thinking the channels of this, I'm more drawing attention to. I'm, and I'm sorry, I would just like to to pick on you guys, but it seems to be more a structural problem than <coughs> the fact that women and young people and people of colour are not thought of as the sort of people who should sit on these panels. It's more an alphabet. Yeah, before the our writers, and now let's have. Oh okay. God, it's not looking that bad. Can, can, like, can I just? Can I? Okay, it's more 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 about the makeup of the panel. I'm going to be completely candid here. Okay. Um, we found out that David was available. Okay. Uh, the book, bookstore asked me to set something up. I am ill. Okay. I asked my colleagues to come because I knew them, and I asked them to help me find other people to come. That's the answer. Okay. Let me make a, a historical point about this because we spent a lot of time on this. And I think it's worth noting, because we, we talked earlier tonight <clears throat> about deliberate ways in which the student movement of the 60s was uh, contained, frustrated, and so on. There is a very interesting theory <coughs> about what the liberal grant-giving foundations did uh, in the early 70s. We know about a lot of steps that business took and so on to make sure that what had happened in the 60s would never happen again, right? Very interesting story. Uh, well, it's interesting to note that, that Ford and Rockefeller and the other foundations with strong CIA connections started giving grants in the early 70s to study uh, race and gender, okay? There was a sudden move toward identity <laughs> politics by these organizations. And the theory is that the reason they did this was to balkanize the left and to prevent it from pursuing any kind of a class or economic analysis. I, 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 you know, without denying the justice of what you're saying, okay, whoops, um, this, is a, this is not an irrelevant uh, theory. I don't think, anyway. Okay, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I called on you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, You're next. So there's a question about uh, student debt and political imagination. Andrew was talking earlier about that we need uh, a affordable university because that's that's the way critical thought and political imagination can be done. We have a chance to do things. But right now, the apex of student debt, we've had this giant jump in political imagination, the first one we've heard in a generation. And that didn't come from the faculty. It came from students at mm-hmm. the University of Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. at the University of California, at NYU, at New School. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, so I guess, uh, and they've been saying things, uh, you know, directly <laughs> opened with, which was that we're going to have to get a little less anarchic in some way uh, or another. Uh, how would the academy recognize political imagination if it slapped it in the face? And is the university something that's necessarily worth saving if it can only produce this sort of political imagination at the point where it's driving its students in poverty? Um, I'm not sure if I can summarize your question adequately because it's a it's a very uh, it, it's a very ambitious scenario. Uh, the, the 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 question you're asking is whether the university quote unquote is worth saving if um, if uh, if at the moment when it it, it, it drives uh, it immiserates the population of the those who it's supposed to be serving uh, if at that very moment that <coughs> is the moment at which uh, at which students will reject um, will reject the prison house of learning if you like and 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 rise up with an insurgent voice was that more or less the gist of what you said? Yeah, but I mean, not just to reject what's going on, but to actually offer a substantial new politi- re- political reimagining of the situation. 
which hadn't happened in the last 40 years, um, that we're saying is happening now, driven by this debt crisis. Mm -hmm. If that's the only way it can produce, you know, the sort of critical imagination you say the university's for, mm -hmm. then why is this something we're trying to go back and defend? Can we, can we paraphrase that? Good um, yeah. Do you want to take this? Do you want me to? I mean, I, I have a response, but it might not be yours, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead? All right. Um, should I repeat the question? You the question is, is the university worth saving? Um, it, we have seen an outburst of, of um, imagination. It didn't come from universities. It seems like universities are incapable of providing it. Why are we even trying to save this institution, which could be as much a part, uh, more a part of the problem than anything else? Would that be a good summary? Uh, okay. Um, uh, yeah. My, my reaction to that is that... that I mean, university is, is something different than its institutional structure. To me, what universities are, are a space where you are allowed to at least think about forms of value that are not economic. Um, you might do it in what is often really stupid ways, but at least there, it, it's a, one of the only areas where society provides authorization to do it. And, and I, I was actually very inspired. I shouldn't say this. It'll prevent me from ever getting a job. Um, but I was very inspired by reading a piece I, I read on the internet once about great and Inflation as a political victory that was won in the 60s. Um, it was basically, what he's saying was that, you know, corporations always want grades to be stricter so they can assess people's, you know, um, your, your grades roughly correspond to your ability to discipline yourself and perform well in a workplace. Uh, they might not measure much else. Um, but, um, you know, so grade inflation, you know, gives what it basically does is it liberates people, at least for a few years, from having to think about that so they can just pursue pursue, you know, whatever they need to pursue in to enrich their imaginative lives, you know, and that might be, you know, drugs, sex, and rock and roll. I mean, that's fine. You know, um, everybody needs a piece of a point in their life when it's okay to, like, actually do all those things and, and, and just think about something other than the money and be in a space where you can think about the meaning of life or whatever. Um which is not utterly under economic discipline. So, so I think insofar as universities were pr preserving, it's because it authorizes a certain space of freedom that you just don't really have any place else in our society, um, at least in a way that you can actually live. I mean, we're trying um, and and still sit there and imagine things. Um, so, you know, it is significant that the people coming out with imagination are to some degree associated with universities, or just not the university themselves. So I, I think that's what needs to be preserved. That the idea that that uh, there are other forms of value that are legitimate, and there is some space in our society where we, where where, where we actually are supposed to be thinking about those and pursuing them. For the whole institutional mm -hmm. edifice. Don't get me started. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Um, are there any conversations in the movement that? are bringing up new ideas versus reactions to things that you're against or that you're looking to go against. Yeah, okay. Whoever's going to answer it. Are there any places in the movement that are not? Yeah. <laughs> that would be my answer. <laughs> Oh, the question was, are there any spaces in the movement that are proposing new ideas rather than simply defining, stating what they're against? And I would say all of them, as far as I can make out. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. But I, I want to uh, break rank a little bit and go back to your question about denial, because I've been thinking about it. And um, I think all of us have... Um, all of us have different explanations for the redistribution of wealth over the last 30 years or so. But one of the ways that, uh, that I've begun to think about this in, in response to uh, the narrative of ecological decline is, think about the Club of Rome report, 1972. This was a report that elites generated on behalf of elites. And a lot of the commentary about the legacy of the Limits to Growth report has been that elites have been in denial about the message that was sent mm -hmm. and continue to be in denial about the message that was sent, which is, you know, that growth-driven capitalism is unsustainable in the long term. But actually, when you think about it, their response has been very rational because their response has been one of hoarding. 
they got the mess the message got through and the action response to the message was to to squirrel away as many of the resources from the Commonwealth as they could over the last 30 or 40 years that's another way of, I mean and that's sort of classic hoarding um, that's another way of looking at the the motivation or the intentionality behind the redistribution of wealth in the last 40 years it's another way of flipping the script and denial <coughs> Mm -hmm. I'm a black female. I don't actually, I like to say brown, but I don't mind that the panel is all white and all male. Um, I, I just care about the, the structure and what is coming out of the panel. Um, I wish that there was someone from OWS in the panel. Ooh, I mean, no, I mean like... Younger? Younger, oh, occupier. Yeah. Actual uh, in the tent person, yeah. Yeah, oh, in the tent. I did, yeah, a little bit, not yeah. long. Yeah, I was only there for a couple of days, actually. Yeah. Um, well, the, uh, the question was, um, uh, I don't know how much of it to paraphrase. Um, the questioner is, is, is brown, self-described as brown, mm -hmm. and uh, doesn't mind that we're all, you know, identical. <laughs> but wishes that someone up here was from Occupy Wall Street, to which the panelists all replied, we're all from Occupy Wall Street, mm -hmm. to which she replied, somebody younger. Okay, <laughs> and also right? someone who actually occupied, yeah. Actually, I mean, somebody who's but actually the, living in the tents, in the, or, or homeless. You know, um, a part of what Occupy Wall Street is about is, uh, the struggle, you know, actually being on the front. front. I'm on. I'm on the front line. I was an occupier since day four. Um, I know some of the occupiers in the room. Um, a lot of them don't know your faces. So, it's a it's a difference between being in the middle of it, or being on the outside and writing about what's going on on the inside. Okay. She says that we should have had somebody who was in the movement as opposed to people who were just outside it and writing about it on their fat asses. No, well, that's not fair. <laughs> you said it's a camp. I mean, no, no, you know. And go ahead. Well, y y David, you want no, to I assume, I assume the point was like actually occupying. <laughs> as a, I mean, like lots of people were doing all sorts of different right. things and still are, you know. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah, Jenny. You're true. Is the question as to whether the future of the Occupy movement is to actually occupy physical space as opposed to finding additional means or alternative means of accomplishing the goals that we uh, have become to define for ourselves? Is this, I mean, do we need to have, to have people who are occupying the kind of part because we're going to occupy it again? No, I think the... The main point of it is knowing uh, the hurt and the pain that we go through. Um, a lot of us don't have housing. A lot of us don't have uh, places to stay. I think a lot of us um, have dealt with the police. I went to, uh, um, I was, I'm charged with a, a felony assault charge um, for the police hitting me. I was in jail for two months. Those those uh, stories um, are important as well as the front line stories are important as well as the the back end stories. The back end stories are what do we do from here, but the front line stories are still happening. You know, we're, there's we're still out there, we're, and people don't know that we're still out there. No, they don't. No, but we're still out there, and we're still occupying. <laughs> okay, so um, I can't adequately paraphrase that, but um, she uh, has suffered it down at the uh, occupation, of, as have I taken a number of other people in the room. Uh, and, the, you know, I guess the question is, why didn't we ask some of you to speak here? This is a fun. This is a fundraiser for for y'all. You know. Um. I'm, not saying, uh, I'm not saying that it is or it isn't. I'm saying that when 
when it comes down to it, a lot of uh, a lot of the people with wealth and with a hierarchical uh, matter of making making uh, making books are able to do certain things but are making those decisions for the people that are not able to do those things. And that's, it always comes down to the people with, uh, the people that have the have and the have nots. It always comes down to the have and the have nots. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think the issue you're raising is one of vanguardism, those who have access to certain types of disseminating ideas through existing channels um i mean what one was trying to do in creating a social movement is to create alternative channels by which which are going to be democratic and when you have a forum like this you know it definitely runs the risk of repro simply reproducing the very structures that we're trying to challenge in the name of you know and what could be more cynical than using a challenge to a certain type of hierarchical authority to do things that will in fact reproduce it um i'm i mean i i it, it's it is a challenge because, on the other hand, if you don't, I mean, you always face this. If you don't use resources that you have to reach a larger audience, the movement, you know, will be crushed all the more easily because people won't even know it exists. So, so I mean, that's kind of this is a benefit for Occupy Media, which is out there to spread the word that the movement still exists, which will actually make it more difficult for cops to beat people up. Um, but you know, in doing so, it reproduces the very structures which you're trying to under to undercut by being in the streets in the first place, and and it's a real problem. I mean, I. I I, I've tried to struggle with that in a few ways. Um, you know, one reason I even structured the thing the way I did, you know, like this thing is like, where should Occupy Wall Street go? You know, I don't want to say. You know, I was throw, you know, I, I consider my role as an intellectual just like that's why I was like throwing out examples of how other people have saw, uh, approached this and, and didn't say which one I think we should do because I oh, one thing an intellectual can do is you have you know knowledge of other people's experiences convey that. We'll hear four things that people have done in other circumstances. Maybe that'll en enrich the discussion, but the bottom-up structure of deciding what to do. Why don't you uh, just let some, of, some hmm. people who've really been in, actively involved in the <laughs> occupation talk about, mm -hmm. not rather than asking you questions, talk about, you know, <laughs> talk to the issue. Go ahead. Okay, so first I wanted to observe that I feel like the structure of the panel has gradually broken down the more that we've started to interrogate it. <laughs> like quite organically, hmm. the level of participation and kind of the authority from which people speak and the way in which people speak to each other has changed. And I think that is part of what we are doing with Occupy, and that mm -hmm. is part of kind of the evolution of the spirit and the movement, is that we are sort of transforming the very structures in which we operate and sort of pushing them and pushing the limits. You, you should talk so, into the mic because this is going to be a video and people are going to watch it. Okay. So some of the... I'm, think, I'm <laughs> thinking I'm not okay because he's right in front of the camera. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to just start by some of the hand signals that we use. We don't clap. We, we do this. But we've been clapping in the room. You know? And a lot of it... This is a panel. We're not in the bar. We're not I'm, GM, I'm, we're in the panel. So... I'm still going to use the hand signals. Like, I was sitting over there and I was going to Sorry, I'll give you So, they wanted some of the occupiers to speak, right? And point of process. They wanted some of the occupiers to speak. So, some of the stories that I, I'm coming with are the cops, the police officers, the police brutality that we've gone through. Um, People don't know about this, and it needs to be said. It needs to be, it needs to be dealt with on a large scale. We need the cops to be a part of us because they are the 99%. But we don't know how to get you guys that are in the room to be a part of us as well. You know, um, the 99% means a lot. It means that the people of all class systems, the people that have dealt with um, a structure of having to go to work, having to go through a school system that was built around um, hierarchy. We're saying that we don't want this anymore. We're saying that we, we, we need something else. We're crying out for something else, right? I went to two schools when I was growing up. One was an all-black school and one was an all-white school. The all-white school, we had free educate both free educational systems 
But the all white school, we had uh, orchestra, free classes of orchestra, free music, free singing lessons, free dance classes. The black school was still teaching ABCs in third grade. To say the system is not fair is to dilute what the problem is. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sure, so I kind of hate to revert to the asking the resident intellectuals more abstract and theoretical questions, but it's 2012, it's an election year in this country, and I think that's kind of the elephant in the room as we think about the possible sort of future horizons of what Occupy might be and how it engages as a political movement, and particularly how it engages with the already existing discourses of nationalism and the already existing political structures even as the political system in which we have is bought and sold by a transnational capitalist class that has no allegiance to this country, the sort of common sense everyday reality in the political imagination that most often comes when one tries to engage with the political system and occupies that somehow there is a primacy of the nation and a primacy of the election and sometimes reform. And I guess I'm just sort of wondering looking back at all of what we've discussed so far tonight, you know, what, what kind of other possibilities might there be for this year and what kind of pitfalls? And that's sort of an open question to really anybody, but I do kind of want to know from you guys. I really do hope that Occupy doesn't get hijacked by this election season. I think it would be not necessarily the worst thing that could happen, but pretty close to the worst thing that could happen. Uh, that said, and I think a lot of people are aware of that. That said, it's impossible to erect, uh, you know, a sort of non-porous wall between a movement like this and the political process. Uh, it's one thing to sort of to try and hold firm to, you know, the Occupy ethos of not making demands on the political process, but for sure there's, there's, there's going to be a lot of um, um, <clears throat> influence in all sorts of ways. And the political class is, you know, is uh, uh, maneuvering to take advantage and to exploit whatever uh, it can uh, from Occupy. It's happened many times before. You know, you think about the populist movement in the late 19th century, you know, this coalition of artisans and farmers, and, uh, and the way in which the political class of the Republican Party at the time, uh, 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 Roosevelt in particular, Teddy Roosevelt, managed to co-opt a lot of that energy into the progressive movement. Um, by that same token, um, elements of the Popular Front Coalition, which is another great populist moment in our history. Uh, you could talk about a similar history with regard to that. If we think about what kind of populist coalition Occupy is mobilizing in the direction of, that would be a very interesting discussion. Uh, which particular fractions, which particular class fractions are available to be mobilized in a coalition. Uh, that wouldn't necessarily have, um, have the aim of intervening in the political process. Um, so uh, uh, I, I really hope it doesn't happen. Um, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's likely that uh, a, a lot of the energy of Occupy will inevitably flow into the election season or the circus is, is the election season, but I think there's enough energy moving in the opposite direction that will take us through it. Um, actually, this is relevant to what you said before, because what we're seeing now is uh, this uh, dog and pony show where Mitt Romney is made to represent the bad capitalist. And he, I mean, it plays the part perfectly, right? <laughs> I mean, he's like central casting sent him down as the <laughs> heartless idiot capitalist, right? And then we hear about Bain Capital and all this, and all this noise from the media about how awkward and stiff and capitalistic and heartless he is. And the tacit message of this is that Obama is not that, you see. Obama is not in any way uh, owned by Wall Street or serves Wall Street, see? Now, I don't think it's irrelevant that as that's going on, 
we hear nothing about the occupation ever at all. I mean, it's just gone. It's absent, right? Uh, and the question then is, how much does that have to do with the fact that they, you know, they roused it out of the park, which was a kind of strategic decision? Because once that spectacle is gone, it's very, very hard to get back into the public eye. And then all we see is this spectacle up there of Romney versus Obama. And, and somehow Obama is made to represent populism, you know, which is so preposterous I can't even find words to sum it up. Uh, but anyway, that's just my... Uh, would you want to say something? Well, I wanted to say that um, a number of us here participated in occupying the New Hampshire primary. Mm -hmm. And there was a very interesting wow. moment in sort of popular press discourse when it was framed as, oh, well, now suddenly Occupy is back. And this is what they're doing. Mm. Because we were jumping into the spectacle and jumping into the media. Right. Yeah. So and, and very much disrupting with the idea that the whole system is screwed up and we shouldn't trust any of these scumbags to make decisions on our behalf. <laughs> or at least that's my opinion. <laughs> okay, yeah. Nick? So I just want to answer, answer that by, you know, from the work that I've actually been doing within Occupy, that the movement took a very active decision to stop you know, to, to concentrate on particular days of action, I mean, as many of you know, um, but none of those have been around the election. So the March 1st, which will be the next major student day of action, and then particularly May Day, uh, which is going to be a coordinated global series of actions, uh, which will be very extensive in New York and, and, and elsewhere. So that there, seemed, there has been a, you know, a different strategy within the movement. There's, Yes, the media have, have repeatedly said that it's over, but they'll always say that. They said that on September the 18th. Um, you know, it, it's been, always already been over as far as they're concerned, and it always will be. But, you know, the Greek bailout, so-called, is falling apart. The Egyptian government just had to take a loan from the IMF. The economic crisis that motivated all this is, is, continues to rumble. And that, you know, the attempt to normalize it and turn it back into the usual dog and pony show of Republicans against Democrats and we're for this and we're for that, that's simply not going to normalize itself. And part of the, you know, to finally answer your question, um, you know, part of the, den the, the denialism tactic has been very effective in driving any discussion of the possibility of incorporating climate into it, because it goes to David's earlier point, which is that as soon as you start having that discussion, then you have to reconfigure the whole mode of production. I mean, that, that, it's as simple as that. Um, and that's a discussion that's really important not to have. And it is now, so we don't see, you know, when we have little, fa little talk pieces about the weather, nobody mentions the word climate change anymore. So, you know, it, 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 it has become uh, extraordinarily effective just on, across the political spectrum. Obama no, no mentions it no more than the others. So I don't actually, I mean, I think uh, what occupies, occupies concentration over the winter and its focus and the necessity of having to come indoors for meetings like this where we would otherwise have had it outside. Um, we've had to do that, but, uh, you know, it'll be warm soon. It's warmer than it already is. And uh, then stuff can kick off. It might be. But. Yeah, I, I, I one thing I want to add. Um, it is kind of odd that, that I want to speak to a um, our, our comment by one of the earlier speakers. I didn't catch your name, but... Lady. Lady. My um, about about police violence, um, and I think it's really interesting. That's one the only thing that hasn't been taken up, um, and it's kind of significant because every, nobody likes violence very much, and we don't like to talk about it. But that's really what this is ultimately all about, because it's the structures of violence that make all this possible. And and um, you know, I always would say during the days of the globalization movement, well, you know, when you have a radical direct action all directly democratic alternative. There is a space for an alliance between more liberal groups and, and radical groups, which is that, you know, the, the radical groups create a fire on your left, so at least the people willing to sit at the table will actually have a place at the table because they seem like the reasonable alternative. And the liberal groups keep us out of jail. Well, you know, the liberal groups didn't really come through this time in a big way. Um, and the fact that nobody's, you know, like what we saw here was a systematic campaign to use you know, so, you know, organized violence to suppress, you know, the first major outbreak of spontaneous, you know, popular direct democracy that America's witnessed in, in, in 
a century, I don't know, a very long time. And that's something of incredible historical significance. I mean, this is something that will be, re- historians will be talking about hundreds of years from now, and they, like, you know, they strutted us. So, I mean, they, they, they attacked us. They beat the shit out of us. And like all those people who should have been screaming to high heaven, what the hell is going on? I thought this was supposed to be a democratic country, kind of failed us because they let it happen. Um, and I really think, you know, you guys want to help everybody. You know, scream to high heaven. Come on, this is outrageous. We need to create a space where we can actually, you know, engage in political activity and not get beaten up. Yeah, I just want good. I just want to note that if Bush were president and this were happening, every liberal in the country would be screaming bloody murder, right? The fact that Obama's president, it's like the Nixon goes to China thing, all this stuff can happen. It gets worse and worse. You know, I, I feel more endangered and threatened personally now than I was feeling when Bush was president. I was attacking Bush all the time on TV and in books, and I'm more nervous now. Uh, the country's more dangerous now, and that has everything to do with the failure of the liberal class to uh, rise above this tribal partisanship, right? And, and, you know, this stuff goes on, and you don't hear a peep out of them. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, last night on CBS, they have a show called The Good Wife. I don't know if anybody saw it last night. I really like it. And, uh, and in, one of the scene, in one of the scenes, the judge stops the trial. It had nothing to do with Occupy. And he just went into a speech looking at the camera saying, I just want to say, I just, I'm really moved right now. I just walked down, came from Occupy Wall Street. He says, those kids are great, they're doing... He just gave this... Run, and then he went back to the trial in the middle of it. And, that came, and he did it a couple of times. And of course, I found that very interesting uh, in the media. Uh, one of the things about the hand, the clapping... I wanted to ask a question, too. One of the things about the clapping and the hand gestures and everything is that I don't want to see that turn into a rule. Just because it's... Right, just because we need it during general <laughs> doesn't mean that every that every place we need to just impose that on somewhere. There's a reason why it exists in the context that it exists, and to decontextualize it and make it into a rule, I think, is a, a mistake. Um, uh, I wanted to ask David a question. I was really, really impressed by the last thing that David was saying in which he you categorized four different oh, yeah. approaches to direct action and dual power structures and the different mm-hmm. paths that they have taken. And I want and I haven't seen that done pretty much anywhere yet, starting with the assumption of you know, revolutionary movements through this type of form. And and then uh, taking it, and here's where this one goes, here's where another one goes. And I wonder if you can elaborate on that, and also to also expand <laughs> the four, because there are others in Africa, there are others in China, oh, yeah, and no. so forth. Well, I mean... Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. I know it's tedious, but paraphrase the question very succinctly. Oh, right. Succinctly. Um, there, were two, there was a point, first, that we shouldn't ritualize our process and, and, and make it into a rule, that um, any imposition of a rule is always a problem. Um and then there was a question about the four types of relation of dual power and revolutionary process that I mapped out. Uh, could I elaborate on other examples? Um, gee, I don't know. Um, I mean, those are the ones that came immediately to mind just because um, I had to finish the chapter in two days. And um, so I'm throwing them out. I think I, it might be a really interesting project to do a, you know, just so I have a lot of people with experience sit in a circle and just sort of throw out examples, compare, contrast, what are the situations certain ones work in certain cases. But I was really throwing it out as a template for something like that. I mean, rather, I mean, it would be a book otherwise. I just don't have the, inter- you know, there's there's a million other cases. There's the case where the st- you just ignore the state. Um, but that's something that can work in other places, you know, where the state's weak anyway. And um, so, you know, I, I, I lived in Madagascar for two years in a place where the state wasn't there, but nobody knew because everybody was so good at like just pretending it was there and uh, making it as easy as possible for the people in power to like just play along with the charade that they had power and not actually enforce anything on anybody. And they just made it clear that if you play along, we'll be really nice to you. And if you don't, we'll make your life a living hell. And um, so they did, you know, I mean, and there's a million ways to do it. Um, and it really depends on the sort of balance of forces and uh, on the ground. So, I mean, obviously, we can't do the Malagasy approach. You know, we don't have a, a 
you know, a thousand years of practicing consensus and a and hundred years of practicing like every form of passive resistance conceivable, which they got in the colonial era. Um, but, um, but, but I think that, that it's a project that really needs to be done. Yeah, yeah collectively. Yeah, I wanted to ask you guys on like the revolution versus reform topic. Moving forward with Occupy, like are we going to... I would love to see huge disruptive protests during the Republican National Convention of Democratic National Convention, personally. But you guys' opinion versus like working within the system, maybe trying to get behind some people going for office and trying to maybe start a party, or revolution, disruptive, you know, disobedience. What are you guys' thoughts on that debate? Who's, who wants to answer that? David? Who, me? Why, well, why not? <laughs> I can't think of anybody better. Uh, the question is uh, uh, revolution versus reform. I'm a revolutionary myself. But I, 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 one of the things I was trying to emphasize is that by creating, I mean, the, the model I like is, you know, when sort of very originally, when there was a lot of discussion about whether we should have demands or not, I think the consensus that emerged was that making demands legitimates the structure, and that delegitimating the structure itself can drive people to do more radical things than demands ever would. Um, so, I mean, the message I always have is, um, you know, we don't need to prove anything. We are the people. You know, like, you need to prove why you're claiming to be our representatives, because you're like a product of an utterly corrupt non-democratic system, which is basically a system of institutionalized bribery. So, you know, it's up to you to prove that you're in any way relevant to our lives. Okay, we have time for one more. Um, I would like to, to know why um, this wonderful movement did not come out before since uh, this society or this pure capitalism has been so immoral with uh, other countries, like uh, for example Latin America. We have the poorest country in this world. Uh, it's Haiti, and our, uh, the intervention the U.S. in Dominican Republic in 1965, in Chile. So why now? Is that because Americans are so afraid of being so poor? Like uh, we have been for so long? Yeah. Or yeah. we like uh, 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 an answer to that question? I got, you want to know what I really think? Well, the question is, why did this happen when it did? Why didn't it happen earlier, particularly given the history of Latin America and America's involvement there? I just want to say one quick thing about that. I mean, I know what you're talking about as I study it, but almost nobody in this country knows any of this at all. And it's not taught in universities either. Okay? Because yeah. I talk about it all the time in my courses, exactly what you're talking about, and students' jaws drop. They had no idea. None. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say, I mean, I, I mentioned I was in Madagascar for a while. One thing I discovered which really shocked me is that, you know, the average Malagasy rice farmer has a much more detailed, realistic understanding of how global finance works, how international trade works, than the average, I don't know, insurance claims adjuster in Nebraska. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's amazed me at first, but it's hardly surprising if you think about it, because no one bothers to lie to them. I mean, why, why, well, they can't do anything about it anyway. Why not tell them what's really going on? You know, America Americans actually could do something about this, so there's that's why we have a you know twenty billion dollar industry designed just to keep us ignorant and stupid. Um, yeah, I mean all the best psychologists in the world are that's what they're working on, keeping Americans ignorant and stupid. Uh, it's going to have some effect. Uh, on the other hand, I mean it's also true that there was a beginning of a movement ninety nine and two thousand. It was starting to happen. It was not on the same scale as this, but it was you know there were like like direct action oriented groups addressing exactly the WTO, IMF, crop up and you know and and there's a history and, and you see it in the civil rights movement you see it in the anti-nuclear movement uh, with the global justice movement every time there starts to be a movement based on principles of direct democracy direct action it grows very quickly it's surprisingly effective the government panics and they always do the same thing they make a lot of concessions and then they start a war 
Um, you know, you got Vietnam, you got Land of Detente, you got the, uh, the Spanish American War. Yeah, I mean, over and over again. I mean, and it, you know, they hit us immediately with the biggest gun they had with the War on Terror, and and um, it worked, and it's you know, it only worked for less than a decade, you know, and and now they're in a situation where it's growing even faster and even bigger, partly because Latin America successfully resisted the IMF. It's basically been driven out as it's been driven out of East Asia. Um, it's come back here. There's um, and and um. It's one of the really interesting things is they don't seem to be in a position where they can use their old approach. Not clear how they're going to declare another war on somebody and distract us. They really kind of can't. So they're yeah they're working on it, but I don't think they're going to be able to do it. So you know it's they they got some problems this time with us. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very it's always difficult to predict when when the organic conditions for any you know insurgency uh, uh, actually will occur. But I think David's right to stress some of the continuity with the global justice movement. Uh, and then there was a climate justice movement that a lot of folks got involved in. But probably, uh, I mean, other than the fact that the, you know, the honeymoon with the Obama administration was definitively at an end, um, I really do think the collective psychology around debt in the global north was a big contributing factor. I mean, it's just, it's almost been impossible to persuade, uh, you know, most citizens in the global north that their standard of living, uh, that the cost of their standard of living is the immiseration of populations in the global south. But the fact that the debt, the debt, um, the debt came home, the chickens came home to roost in a way, was a, was a huge blow to the collective psychology of the global north. And the people were looking at their own immiseration, and they were looking at the instruments of their own immiseration for the first time. I think the 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 the, the, psycho the infrastructural psychology of that really had a lot to do with how and why Occupy ignited in the way it did, and why so many people became you know sort of emotionally aligned with it, whether they were involved with it or not, from a great distance. It was a great question. Okay, um, first of all, I've been asked to announce that there's an Occupy Town Square in Tompkins Square Park this Sunday, starting at 11. Uh, so if you're interested in going to see what they're talking about, you can definitely do that. All right, that's one thing. Probably won't get arrested. Probably, yeah, probably won't get arrested, that's, that's good. Mm -hmm. and I want to I uh, reiterate what Andrew said, that tomorrow at 1, on the campus of NYU, there's going to be a, a huge, what we hope, demonstration against what we call the Sexton Plan, which is NYU's plan to plunge uh, its immediate neighborhood into 20 years of live construction. 20 years. And they're going to build a huge hotel. Uh, it's like Donald Trump is the president of NYU. Mm -hmm. And it has everything to do with debt. It has mm -hmm. everything to do with debt. It's all, about, it's all being financed by more debt. So um, please, if you can, if you're inclined, show up there tomorrow at 1. Our next event is March 28th, and it is going to be about the corporate university and its impact on the city. What do you think that has to do with? Right? Our panelists will include Jennifer Washburn, whom I asked first, <laughs> okay? Andrew Ross again, whom I asked second. Sharon Zukin, whom I asked third. And Tom Angotti, whom I asked last. And it's gonna be a great panel. These are all people, you know, studied the, the corporate university or the, um, the destruction of cities by you know, real estate interests and so on. Because, you know, we're talking about something that's actually uh, uh, been going on for years, and the city right around us is being destroyed piecemeal. This plan is a huge jump ahead. It's destroying a big chunk of it all at once. It is quite radical. Uh, so that's the event in March, April, the first Tuesday, I think it's April 4th. Uh, is going to be uh, an anti-war panel. And uh, then in May, we're doing one on the right wing. Now, um, I would urge you, if you're interested, is to you know, keep checking the website for the bookstore, McNally Jackson. And you know, uh, these are gonna, we're going to do one every month. They're called News from Underground. This is a special one. This is a kind of fundraiser for uh, you know, um, the uh, indie media movement, right? 
Occupy Media, mm-hmm. and I, you didn't pitch that hard enough at the beginning. Mm-hmm. This is a fundraiser, so you know Give they need fun. money in order to <laughs> do this media. So you know if you could just throw a couple bucks in there, it would be great. And now I've asked you to spend money already on the books, which y- y'all rarely do. You know, come, you listen to the talk, you talk, you, you know, then you walk out. So you know, the books are here, the authors are here. Uh, thank you very much. I think this is a great event. Um, I think it was anyway. Thank you for coming, and um, I hope to see you all tomorrow and then next next month. Thanks. <laughs>